I'll be talking about U.S. college campus-based activism. Of course, there's students all over the world, and there are students at different levels um, who are engaged in activist or not um, um, activities, but I'll be focusing on the U.S. college university campuses. And by activism, I, I don't have a very specific or a very long political science definition. I basically think this is work by college students to bring about political or social, cultural, environmental, economic change. Um, and there's folks who measure this in our profession for a living, and um, by most metrics, um, both anecdotal and what measure of social movement activity and so on we have, it uh, is widely regarded as on the rise. The question, of course, is, is whether that's sustainable. We might circle back to that in some of the question and answer period um, at the end. All right, here we go. I'll start with the 60s. It's a little fraught to dive into an era that some of our webinar participants may well have lived through. Um, I'll make a few general points. One is that um, we mostly associate the great activism of the 1960s or the so-called 60s um, with uh, anti-Vietnam mass movements on campuses. Um, that Actually, the main bulk of that activity took place in the early 1970s. So I'm going to go back really to the phases of the student movement that existed before there was the major anti-Vietnam uh, movements of 1970, 71, even beyond that into 72. Um, and most scholars who look at student activism in this early, in early era um, divide the 60s roughly into three phases, early, middle, and late. Um, if you go to the early period, um, many of our uh, social norms were through, in upheaval through the 1950s. This was certainly not unique um, to 1960, but many of us who, who look at this level of activism, um, origins really come about in 1960. Uh, it was the first mass demonstration since World War II that, uh, that happened on campuses in any, in any significant number um, in the United States. It was triggered by a special uh, field hearing by the House Un-American Activities Committee um, on to investigate communism in the San Francisco Bay Area. And there were more than 1,000 UC Berkeley students who uh, responded vehemently to that field hearing and the notion that there would be um, some investigation, or in some cases their professors or even student movements, among others. So a lot of us trace the stirrings of the, the great 60s activism among students to that specific 1960 event. More common, if you take in, and here you have an example of what was called Operation Abolition, actually became a film eventually, um, the Battle of City Hall. You can see some of the details there. It's a vintage poster now, which uh, it's possible to buy, and our marvelous modern commodified version of, of some of these activist countercultural efforts. Uh, more commonly, if you're teaching on this or even discussing it casually, you'll go back to the SDS formation initially in Ann Arbor and the spread across the country of Students for Democratic Society, the Port Huron statement um, beginning so memorably. I'm actually able to quote it from memory, where people of this generation, bred in modest comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably to the world we will inherit. Um, and on it went from there in a very inspiring for lots of folks kind of way. So you've got in this early phase, a uh, sort of focusing moment, and out of that flows um, in COET and then starting to form into actual organizations through Students for Democratic Society chapters, first at Michigan and many other places as well. Um, this is an example of a major rally held um, at Michigan in the, in the bowl um, and uh, just a few months after that. And one of many, many photos from this era that um, all of us can um, find familiar. The rise of the so-called New Left is uh, associated powerfully with this period, as is the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, this alphabetization acronyms um, we could go on for for days, and I'm not um, meaning to revisit this history, but just remind us of a few specifics of that, uh, of that nature of activism as a backdrop for the kinds of events and activities we're seeing today. The so-called New Left was a direct rebuke to the idea of an old left, which was more the um, FDR, liberal-based coalition, there was at least a general sense that that old left was willing to work within the system, um, primarily focused on labor rights for workers. Uh, the new left uh, was defining, and also, sorry, the old left was um, often associated, at least in the new left's rebuke, with um, Soviet Union and communist kind of support. Uh, this had seemed across the 
City College New York Carol Sells and indeed across the country to be an inspiring possible wave of the future and uh, certainly um, the Cold War took its toll on that perspective and point of view and the new left um, define themselves as working outside the system um, seeking radical change um, at the heart of the system a uh, very anti-liberal kind of effort. The new left review begins in 1960 so we're in the same early phase but it really starts to gain force. This is a um, an example from down the way a little, and you can see the kinds of issues that they um, are opposing and, and opposing. Uh, marked by a kind of real participatory democratic ethos. Um, it's gotten a bad name in some activist circles subsequently because it took so long to come to consensus. Um, uh, both historians and political theorists also identify this in a radical democratic kind of way. These radical democratic, uh, participatory democratic notions never quite live up in practice to their ideal um, or the, the theorized notion of how they should work. But the new left and its early variant on campuses certainly came pretty close in lots of ways. And lots and lots of examples um, along the way. The free speech movement, the FSM, um, uh, brought together lots of groups. Um, uh, Anti-war early in the mid early 1960s and mid-60s. Civil rights, feminists, anti-apartheid was in there as well. Lots of causes involved. But Above all, participatory ethos. We see an example here from Northwestern University, um, not a particularly um, unexceptional moment. This is one of the many, many student gatherings across campuses that we saw under the banner of STS and or the New Left um, in that era, and again, marked by participatory efforts all across the board. Um, strongly countercultural aspect or feel to it. Um, no surprise there. It is where you'll see the, the um, parenthetical contrast to the old left there based on its labor issues and, and class struggle and again a kind of Marxist or in some cases Soviet uh, man. The countercultural piece is worth noting in part because um, a number of folks who were not, not students um, came onto campuses uh, to join protests in some cases to, um, to set up tents and live for example in People's Park in Berkeley. Um, some of this free speech movement attracted um, more violent elements and, and a hippie movement. Um, those are not to be um, uh, mixed up, of course, but also enabled folks like Governor Reagan in California at the time, um, indeed eventually Richard Nixon in the White House, lots of um, folks on the side of law and order, shall we say, to point fingers at these student activist movements um, in part because of the perhaps excesses of the countercultural, often countercultural elements, often not themselves students. And, if you've taught this, you've been through these details, but just worth um, noting here. Um, and one example of uh, the Kankese version of this kind of activism, which again aligned with students, in some cases um, was students, but often uh, was not. Um, strongly anti-liberal cast, I mentioned that a moment ago. Um, the notion was, at least as was characterized by new left writers and, and theorists and avatars and spokespeople, the uh, old left was made up of liberals who worked within the system. This was a strong rejection of that point of view. And um, there's some wonderful quotes in books like Todd Gitlin's of that era about the, um, you know, the greatest enemy of liberalism is actually from the left, uh, to lots of people's surprise. A whole set of issues that will be surprising to none of you who've got any sense of the 60s. Um, these are some of the main ones, of course. Um, Vietnam arising later in the movement, I'll make that point again. Um, certainly African American rights um, arising powerfully. Gay rights towards the end of the 60s uh, became a heart of this. Feminism all the way across. Um, drug legalization or at least relaxation of strict anti-drug rules and then um, it was, there were also strong pro-abortion elements uh, in the movement as well. I mentioned earlier things like anti-apartheid, uh, free speech in all its varieties and so forth. Lots of tactics were involved across this movement and we, as we move um, through the 60s towards the big um, anti-Vietnam efforts, draft arises in the mid-60s, um, you see some a shift in tactics. So initially there was a lot of student alignment with faculty against administrations across the country. It was a typical alignment in lots and lots of places. Um, there was initially in the early to mid 60s sit-ins demonstrations as the anti-Vietnam effort grew and by now we're in you know, Columbia in 1968 and Cornell in the end of the 60s into the 70s, lots of Berkeley of course all the way across, lots of campuses, um, so there's a sit-down demand um, associated with civil rights of course, in some ways um, 
echoing lunch counter sit-ins uh, beginning right nearby here in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960 and moving forward from there. Um, as we move into the later 1960s, you see a, a more uh, vehement and pointed uh, effort, in part this is inspired by anti-war slash anti-draft movements from students, but the notion that the monster, that is the university administration, had to have its brain killed or the university itself, and the tactic shifted from uh, less you know, dramatic sit-ins and demonstrations and teach-ins to um, strikes, building seizures, shutting down the university. There were big efforts of that type, um, and even violence in the form of, for example, the bombing in Madison of the Army Math Research Center, um, the post-Kent State, of course, itself a, um, a, a dreadful and tragic high-water mark um, of the era. Um, in all kinds of ways, you see an uh, escalation um, both of the anti-movement efforts um, from the Nixon administration by the late 60s, um, from again governor's offices across the country and notably California, um, as well as New York, and um, a whole set of uh, tactics on campus, um, efforts to delegitimize that protest. Um, and comes to a head in a number of places. These are you know, woven into the DNA of Americans who either lived through it or have looked back at it, um, as I have, the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, and so on across one moment after another. Um, and in some ways, you see the culmination um, reach a, a tragic tipping point away from um, mass student activism with the rise of the weather underground, a sort of offshoot of the Student for Democratic Society and the um, and their accidental bombing of a townhouse in 1971 um, actually lived a block away and have a childhood, early childhood memory of that bomb going off and um, the wild um, excitement that ensued from there. So we've got a very brief, probably doing violence to the richness of this history, brief uh, reminder of what student activism in the 60s looked like, what some of the tactics were. I want to now just briefly, uh, sorry, here's a, a image of the bombing at the Army, Army Math Research Center in Madison. Um, this is the student newspaper. Um, and yeah, There was a warning, this is a bomb, there's no joke. Um, this is no bullshit, man, as, as the folks in loudspeaker were warning. Um, I'll move now for a moment to how political scientists, sociologists, um, you know, others who have taken a look at this era from across the disciplines um, explain 60s activism. And I'm doing, again, violence to nuance and detail, but it, um, there's some very good writing about this, and you, you tend to get a set of general explanations. There's kind of residual category. There was just the times. The, um, this is unsatisfying, but it does make a certain degree of sense. And when I talk to students about the 60s, they've got this general sense that, you know, inherited um, from their parents, grandparents, readings, and so on, TV shows, um, that there was you know, burgeoning movement in the 50s with Brown v. Board and civil rights in particular movements, and we just wound up in a cultural spot where this kind of activism was almost expected. And it's, um, it's a wispy and difficult to grasp explanation, but it's got a lot of at least intuitive power behind it. Um, a lot of this some um, very good critical race theory and other um, race and ethnicity based historical explanations and research around um, the central place of um, of race and ethnicity in these student activist movements of the so-called 60s era, stretching back to the 50s and again forward into the 70s. Um, there's a, some good writing that suggests that there were really outside organizations, outside agitators, the Nixon administration might have called them, but it, who encouraged students, um, aligned with them, joined with them. Some of it was labor unions, although again the, um, the so-called new left was resisting this um, traditional identification of uh, would-be activists um, with uh, labor in particular, but certainly there were outside organizations of various types who were um, engaged with, sometimes through faculty and sometimes with students directly, in trying to spur and encourage some of this activism, anti-war and otherwise. Um, there's an institutional explanation that um, was popular in some of the writing at the time. If you look at the New Left Review, for example, you'll see article after article um, about the um, overly rigid U.S. educational style in universities and colleges at the time. Um, certainly something to, um, to respond to is the notion there. Again, a, 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 these will not be unfamiliar categories. I just want to lay them out in part to contrast what we see today. 
Um, and then in general, um, often uh, written by these youth themselves about their altruism and energy and the integrity they felt and the uh, sort of a combination of a, a cultural and institutional explanation. They're reacting to the, um, the obviously the wartime institutional um, engagements by the government, um, but also a variety of uh, repressive or at least restrictive policies to which they responded. So a set of explanations that a, a, even a, a brief canvas of the social science literature will, will yield about where this activism came from, what inspired it, um, along with the Vietnam War, which um, obviously is um, a letter-based explanation. All right, let's move forward to the present. I'm going to, again, um, leap blithely over some remarkably nuanced and engaging um, historical detail from the post-Vietnam era and so on forward, but as a college student in the 80s and then a graduate student in the 90s and a professor right on through, I'm certainly used to the charge that campuses today, whatever era we were in, didn't reflect anything like the um, wonderful student engagement and act activism of the 60s. Um, and then we get to the the most recent period, and it's interesting to, to try to characterize, sort of, as we're in this history, um, what this looks like from a contemporary perspective. So the origins of, again, we'll, we're going to stipulate, as the lawyers say here, that there is a rise in activism on, on campuses. So if some of you webinar um, audience members are on a campus where nothing at all has happened and are, in fact, unaware that anything is happening elsewhere, then um, that, that you may be, in fact, the rule or you may be the exception to the rule. But, on a number of campuses across the U.S. today, indeed, again, globally, but I'm focused on the U.S., um, there is a significant uptick in students engaging in all kinds of activities and um, of an activist nature, and including civil disobedience acts, uh, marches, sit-ins, demonstrations. It feels more like the early 60s than the more violent protests of later, but on campus after campus from, um, indeed, places where I've spent time, like Syracuse, as Tony mentioned, um, stretching across to its you know, near neighbors at Colgate and Cornell and then um, out to the California schools and down here to the south to places like Duke and, um, and indeed our own campus here at Wake Forest. And rather than dealing with the anecdote, I thought it would be interesting to just try to get a sense of what the origins of this activism um, look like. And I can't find any um, good detailed writing on this yet, so this is mostly based on polls of fellow provosts, informal conversations, and the like. But it's interesting. I, I, I'm going to show four or five of the explanations that come up more than three or four times and, and leave these to hover by way of us trying to make sense of uh, what seems most plausible as an explanation. I'd love to have feedback and engagement with some of you on the webinar um, as we go along. Some people say this is a generational um, explanation, that these remarkable young um, you know, millennials, Gen Y members um, exhibit this remarkably high level of volunteerism. They are from middle school or at least high school more prone to get engaged in social causes. So this is a natural outgrowth of that once they get to campus. And indeed the heart of the generation, if we take the uh, usual sort of markers of generations, is now sort of 18 to 26 year old. So they are very much on campus and, and just leaving it. So this may just be a, a generational cycle, and I'll circle back to that point a little later on. Um, maybe it's the Obama campaign. You see here an example of many, many um, uh, headlines and um, not so much scholarly argument, we're still getting around to that, but notions that um, Barack Obama's campaign was so extraordinarily galvanizing, it sparked a kind of student activism and engagement. As you can see in this piece, look at the bottom, the ferment is unparalleled since 1968. Um, as we look back, from the vantage point of the end of the nearing the end of the Obama administration, um, this may feel a little overstated, but it's uh, interesting to see that at the time, especially Obama's first campaign, it felt like this was an awakening moment. As someone who um, was the sort of dorm parent in a 214-member freshman NYU dormitory or residential college, um, when Obama came through Washington Square Park in 2007, and see the dorm empty into the park and the level of excitement and engagement, um, I can testify. Uh, that one certainly felt that way at the time. Um, hard to say again that that has sustained its way through. We heard again as the Occupy movement arose initially in um, the um, sort of tri small vest pocket park in New York, Zuccotti Park, and then moving um, really across the globe but across many campuses as well. This is a Times headline from a year or so in. You can see that the Occupy movement was shifting onto campuses, and there was market examples of that. Um, debate 
to this day among, you know, again, again, well, it's anecdotal, but about whether that was the spark that lit um, the degree of activism we see now, or whether it was like the Occupy movement itself, a uh, moment that flickered and faded away. The I2M movement, and if you're unfamiliar with this, or hashtag I2M, I should say, um, the question mark after each of these is merely, is this um, the best explanandum or the best example of, of, of how, how this current round, round of activism originated? If you haven't seen I2M, it began at Harvard. Um, it, hashtag, for those of you not Twitter literate, uh, when it goes on Twitter, the hashtag means you can follow the I2M um, fill in the blank school. Um, this is a, a powerful example of literally thousands of such that eventually spread across the country. Um, students, uh, often, though not exclusively, students of color, um, with a, a whiteboard like this, with a powerful statement, often something said to them, or at least a response to um, their experience, along with a hashtag, I too am. It began at Harvard, and we saw it spreading all around. There's an I too am Wake Forest uh, movement that um, arose sometime after Harvard's, which was around 2011-2012. Um, but this, some um, say, really galvanized a sense of um, stirring um, potential protest that has um, resulted in some of the kinds of activist movements we've seen since. Um, and then most uh, easily reached for, or certainly you hear this in news accounts and more casual um, discussions of activism on campus. Well, it's a response to Ferguson. And indeed, here in the Stanford Daily, you see a kind of um, direct correlation between, in this case, the, um, both the aftermath of the Michael Brown tragedy, but also the um, court decision to exonerate um, the white officer who shot him. And uh, you've seen examples like this all across campuses. Obviously, there is going to be some reinforcement and mutual engagement. It may be that some collection across all five of these and others I haven't thought of. I'd love to see additions. Um, this feels like it's worth writing about, so I'd love to get feedback um, from you all on the webinar um, about where this feels like it, it is or should be heading. What's the nature of this activism today? If, if we, best we can do is, is list some possible sources of origin, and, and maybe it's a, it's a collection of those, varying degrees of intensity. I know that my Social science colleagues will be exploring this in more um, empirical form in, in coming months and years. And if they've, you've done it already and I missed your article, apologies, and let me know the reference, and I'll fix the webinar next time around. Um, what's the nature of activism today? Does it look and feel like that 60s sort of institutional or cultural outside organization, et cetera, um, explanations? Um, tends to be cause-based to a significant degree. This is one, um, I thought, really intriguing piece I read recently um, on how uh, Campuses' non-discrimination statements have come to include transgender students and indeed faculty and staff members. This has been a result of student activism, is the claim here, and this is an empirically based piece in the Journal of Social Issues, as you can see. But lots and lots of specific causes, uh, a whole variety of them. Um, obviously, gay rights, both or LGBTQ rights, I should say, um, both through transgender movements um, as well as gay marriage. Um, have been leading uh, causes that have helped inspire these changes on campus. Um, a lot of, again, as, as in the 60s, I think here is a parallel, a lot of race and ethnicity based, um, much of the I2M movement again um, was at least initially students of color um, posing some very painful and stark questions and dilemmas um, for those of us in the classroom and administrative positions about the nature of campus inclusion um, of climate climate across our campuses that has been a powerful discussion um, for a couple of years and more here at Wake Forest, and I'm, I'm sure that's true across most, if not all, of your campuses for those of you on the webinar. I will note again, though, that this is a, um, it's been a distinctively cause-based as opposed to a, um, you know, large ideological uprising. Um, there have been uh, you know, sort of a whole set of specific causes that you can see um, taking place. I would say, and this is not based on a, you know, any hard science or even soft science um, account, but the sense I have, if, if we'll allow a, an anecdotal sense, is that these movements have been episodic on campuses. Uh, we saw a lot of the 60s movements where campus would be shut down for days, weeks, even in some cases months. Uh, just crowds growing larger, sit-ins of the type we see in you know, 
squares around the world in, um, in Kiev and Tiananmen many years before. Um, that seemed to characterize some of the 60s actives. And People's Park was an occupied place for an extended period of time. Campuses, we've seen much shorter duration of sit-ins, demonstrations, um, even nature of demand. It's been more episodic, um, often as a result of a flashpoint like the Ferguson decision or an incident specific to a campus. We'll have a, you know, an event here on Wake Forest campus, for example, um, a, a you know, grotesque act um, that appears to have been directed against our imam um, on campus, and there's a flash of response and engagement, and it fades away. And that may be um, characteristic of this generation's style of activism. Hard to know exactly, but it, it does seem distinctive compared to that of the 1960s. It's also a lot more organized, at least for, for the historical understanding I have of the 60s events, which had a, could have a real raffish, loose feel to them. A lot of organization around activism today, and that's also in some ways a hallmark of this generation. I mean, this, for example, is a summit of Montana student activists. They have a mission statement and a web page, and as you can see at the top, participation organizations and trainers and sponsors and organizers and supporters. And it, it's a remarkable example of the level of organization. Probably this is technology aided, um, but you compare it to the you know, somewhat off the cuff nature of activist movements in the 60s, and you can see a real interesting distinction. Um, we have awards for student activists today, and any of you who might have been on campus in the 60s might be chuckling when you imagine something of this type, and it's, there's a certain earnestness and engagement that is you know, powerful to see, and is also, again, feels emblematic of, of the distinctive nature of this generation's approach to activism. It's a more conservative group, by and large, and by this I don't mean it's a politically conservative type of activism. It tends to be valence towards the left, often you know, the, the farther left even, and yet there is a much more conservative nature to it. Students don't like to get arrested, for example, whereas if they seem to go um, and generalizing. Of course, there are plenty of examples where brave students have stood up in all kinds of ways, but in general, on balance, this is a more you know, rule-based, organized, uh, playing by the rules of activism, as it were. You know, you look at, for example, the um, you know, multiple-day sit-in of students at Syracuse, and it resulted in a 52-page you know, single-space annotated document where the students would issue a set of demands. The administration you know, wrote back to annotate them. The students had their annotations on annotations. It looked like you know, a, a sort of an elaborate Google Doc. Um, and that, that feels distinctive in ways that 60s activists may either point out with a chuckle or roll of the eyes or, in some cases, a, a nod of respect. Um, you can get more accomplished, one might imagine, when you are, in fact, organized and, and professional, almost, uh, in, in your activism practices. Um, and here you have a, a debate in the Stanford newspaper about um, whether the student activism was productive or reckless. And this speaks a bit, I think, to the, the more conservative nature. Again, for those of you who are hearing that word go by and it's a red flag, or seeing that word on the screen, it's a red flag. I don't mean it's activism around conservative causes. Certainly that is present on campuses. We have plen plenty of Federalist Society or other you know, conservative-based um, students who often um, bring their um, causes to, to the forefront and, and fight hard on, on their behalf. But the kind of activism that's been growing attention, garnering headlines and so on, tends again to be on the left, and yet there are real debates about the nature of how it's carried out. So the nature of the activism, although it's liberal or, or even farther left in its um, intentions, is a certain conservative feel to the process and procedures by which it's carried out. Where does this activism come from? Um, I, I gave four or five of what social scientists have offered about activism from back, whoops, sorry about that, from back in the 50s. You've just got my entire um, calendar up on your screen. Let's circle back to our actual webinar. I'm going to leap forward a bit. Um, and, look at these, and look at these explanations for activism today. Um, this is a little different from where the origins came from. This is sort of an explanation at a social scientific or you know, deeper structural level. There are those who, um, it's not so much that um, they're advocating this specifically, but there is a way in which you've, I've seen some interesting writing and heard a couple talks about the cyclical nature of this activism. James Marone's wonderful Democratic Wish book, Jim is of course my co-author co of the We the People, sorry, By the People um, textbook that Tony mentioned at the outset of this webinar. Jim's book, Democratic Wish, 
posits a certain kind of cyclical activity to democratic engagement activism. Samuel Huntington, um, 35 years ago, described the cycles of um, democratic engagement driven by what he called creole passion. And just to remind us that there is real cycles to U.S. youth engagement um, from almost the beginning. The revolution itself, which we may think of as fought by people in powdered wigs, you know, Benjamin Franklin, a, an elderly gentleman at the time, was in fact a season of youth, as Michael Kamen's wonderful book reminded us um, uh, many years ago. Um, this was a revolution uprising of young people, and so it has been across multiple periods. Jacksonian democracy is... Harry Watson and many other writers on the Jacksonian era remind us that this was, um, you know, twenty-somethings who were advancing these causes, um, these the expansion of white male suffrage, for example, all the way across the country, not just to the property. These are moments of major democratic change, and they're driven by young people, and they tend to seem to be cyclical across time. Um, come forward to the progressive movement again, a, a youth's movement in so many significant ways. Um, Jane Addams and her magnificent um, reminiscences about Hull House and one of the hallmarks of the progressive era um, writes a little ironically but also forthrightly, um, some of us had numbered our years as far as 20. Again you get this sense these are young people rising up to bring about major social change. Back in these eras not so much on campuses, um, there weren't that many college campuses to act on and, and virtually um, not back in the revolutionary era but, era, but it is young people's movements that bring about these kinds of change. You see a socialist Sunday school um, in Williamsbridge back in, um, in this progressive era. These are obviously not activists themselves, but um, it, it's to give a flavor of the period of the time. And then come forward to the period we've been talking about a moment ago, the so-called 60s, which really, again, are, uh, begin with lots of ferment and tumult in the 50s um, in, in that particular decade. And, and one hardly needs to characterize this as a youth movement. Um, it was uh, young radicals and the multiversity um, as the SDS uh, writers favored. So it's interesting, I mean, those of you who are um, social scientists with a mathematical bent will notice that there's a real periodicity, a sort of 60-year cycle to these bursts of democratic change inspired by, by young people um, that leads one to wonder about this next cycle and whether um, what we see now is, in fact, in a way, American history. Of course, it's not destiny, but it does seem to have a certain periodic nature to it, almost right on cue. Um, one example from UC Berkeley today, this is one of the die-ins that followed um, both the Michael Brown and Eric Garner um, killings, and one is seeing more of the same after this tragic event um, just from a couple days ago in North Charleston, South Carolina. So one possible explanation or one part of a, of a um, complex multivariate explanation is that we see a cyclical nature to youth engagement back over 250 years and there's no difference or at least we're, we're in some ways right on cue today. Um, Toc Alexis Tocqueville, not in democracy in America, but another great work of his on the French Revolution and the Ancien Regime um, made the point that it wasn't the poorest of the poor who rose up in the French Revolution, rather it was those who had had nothing but began to get something. I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing terribly or paraphrasing poorly, but um, his basic thrust, is, as we remember if we read that, if we know our Tocqueville, is that it's really folks who have begun to taste the opportunity for a better life who then become impatient and go to the barricades and bring a desire change. So it may be that as a result of positive changes in American society, including at universities, of, the opening up of once closed university doors to lower income, more diverse student bodies and the like that rising expectations naturally follow as, as Tocqueville and many writers since have described. Um, movements, particularly youth movements, can um, be marked by a certain impatience and if you are you know, completely out of the center and oppressed at every turn it's very difficult to mount um, some kind of activist charge. You're merely trying to keep yourself alive and Instead, it may be, again, this is a, these are all hypotheticals or at least uh, um, uh, hypotheses to be tested, uh, and I hope my colleague shall, uh, and, and again, intend to write further on this myself, but it may be that what we see today is a version of rising expectations on campuses as we see more um, traditionally um, excluded groups move into places of, uh, of central importance on campuses uh, this is an interesting theoretical um, notion of how this increased activism has come about. Um, there are plenty of materialist explanations um, for uh, this. Uh, one need look no farther than almost any headline about the crushing burden of student debt, the soaring cost of college. It could well be that students 
um, facing grim futures because of the cost of this vital kit ticket of a college education into the, you know, at least the middle class, if not, if not better. Um, there's a kind of materialist explanation for rising activism on campus being driven by real concern about ability to pay for college and, and or about ability to live anything like a meaningful, fulfilling life after college because of the crushing burden of student debt. Um, there are um, powerful suggestions. Deborah Stone has written about this. There's a group of fellow political scientists, including folks like David Scotchpole, Jacob Hacker, um, Suzanne Mettler, Larry Bartels, um, Larry Jacobs, a number of um, my particularly Americanist political science colleagues have written very thoughtfully about um, the nature of inequality and how it's felt on campuses. And if you're in a class that is, or you're, or you're a part of a study group or a, a student organization that is paying attention to the plutocracy um, and the growing distance between the 1% and the rest, or the top 10% in terms of income and wealth, um, it, it, it may feel natural enough to move towards protesting any such um, exhibitions about on your campus or just protesting them in general, and there's your campus as a good um, place to do so. Focusing events, John Kingdon, if you, those of you who are not, may not be familiar with the work of, of Kingdon and his remarkable um, series of books on the way that issues get framed and um, agendas get set, uh, he f explains and among many um, very useful theoretical accounts of public policy making, the notion of a focusing event. Um, so, you know, for example, we go many years in the U.S. Um, in the 60s and 70s without um, real opposition, even in, in an in a, um, environmentally conscious age, to nuclear power. In fact, it's the opposite. This is seen as clean, safe, um, desirable form of, of, of power generation. Not much activism or even meaningful opposition to an expanding number of nuclear power plants. And then the extraordinary focusing event in 1979 of Three Mile Island, the meltdown, and an enormous anti-nuclear um, power industry and activist effort leaps into uh, leaps into the fore thereafter. So here is an explanation for increased activism that goes back to this question about origins um, and links directly to Ferguson and Eric Garner's death and a variety of focusing events. Again, some on campuses, some na nationally based, but uh, one significant explanation is that you know, students see these outrages, they're galvanized, they see other students rise up, and it becomes a, a national trend. Lots of institutional explanations of various types as well. Some of this has to do with, I'll circle back to student debt, some of it has to do with a modern version of rigidity of educational environments. This uh, echoes the kinds of complaints that students were voicing in the 1960s. We see some of this today. Peter Scotch wasn't written specifically about students in this regard, but she's such a wonderful um, reminder of the importance of state or other kinds of regulatory and police-based establishments in um, explaining political outcomes that uh, there needs to be a good institutional account of increased activism today as well. And then finally, the notion uh, that some of this activism itself is a response to social constructions um, that place certain groups, particularly non-white, non-male, um, at a in unfavorable positions that can explain a sort of response to that um, being socially misconstructed, as it were, misconstrued um, in a racial context. Um, Hall, among many others, has written powerfully about um, young people's activist responses to, to the, the way society is constructed. Um, in a policy base, uh, Schneider and Ingraham or Ingram have done um, a number of powerful both books and articles about the way this plays out in the public policy space. Um, that's uh, end of my time. I have um, have found working through this in preparation both for the webinar and more generally for um, conversations with students and presentations and eventually writing about the nature of activism on campuses today from a you know, historical slash social science standpoint. There's lots of ways to write and talk about them. And for, these, for those of you on the webinar who thought this might be more of a debate on what we might do in response to outrages like Ferguson and and so forth. Uh, my apologies, this has been more of a political scientist's approach, particularly a historical based, uh, historical institutionalist approach um, to the kinds of activism we see today. I'm going to therefore turn things back over to Tony, our fabulous uh, host and sponsor with lots of thanks and I look forward to your thoughts and feedback in days and weeks to come. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rogan. We appreciate your time and insights. Um, if you have any questions for Rogan, I invite you to send those directly to me at Tony Mathias. That's T-O-N-Y.
dot m a t h i a s at o u p dot com. I will share them with Rogan, and he will do his best to answer your questions in a timely manner. Again, thank you for your time uh, today, and uh, always feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions with regard to this webinar or any of the other offerings that we have at Oxford University Press. I all hope that you have a great weekend. Take care. Goodbye.